Welcome to this week's Humanities Forum. I'm glad you all could make it out. The order of business this afternoon is uh, our guest, Professor Bartlett, will speak. There will be a Q&A after that. And then, I need to announce this now because I always forget to announce it, but afterwards there will be a reception in the great room just down the hall for you all to continue the conversation and enjoy finger foods of various descriptions as well. So the Humanities Forum is an opportunity for the members of Providence College to engage regularly in intellectual life outside of the classroom to deepen your appreciation of the humanities and to explore different perspectives on and off campus. Most Fridays during the semester, we have some sort of event going on here, a scholar, a writer, a filmmaker, et cetera. Um, and today, this particular humanities forum is being brought to you by the Frederick Douglass Project, which is an initiative of the humanities program. And the aim of the Frederick Douglass Project is to cultivate in students the skills of reasoned debate and persuasion necessary for a healthy and free society. It's made possible thanks to the generous support of the Jack Miller Center. The Frederick Douglass Project promotes a greater understanding of the importance of rational disputation and persuasion in our democracy, which I think will be something which is touched on today, and it offers students an opportunity to practice those arts. Today our speaker is Professor Robert Bartlett, of, who holds an endowed chair in Hellenic Political Studies at Boston College. And as I hope you remember from the first semester of CIF, Hellenic means ancient Greek. So Professor Bartlett's research and teaching focuses on classical political philosophy, such as Thucydides, Plato, Xenophon, and Aristotle. Before he came to Boston College, he was a professor of political science at Emory University, where he won multiple awards for a distinguished teaching. Professor Bartlett has published articles in the American Political Science Review and other leading scholarly journals, and is the author and editor of nine books. And I'll go off script for a second here to say that <clears throat> in the early days of the pandemic, when it seemed like we had all this extra time on our hands, you know, before the, the ennui and the misery set in, I thought, oh, this is a great chance for doing some self-improvement reading. And I had friends and loved ones who told me that it was a disgrace and a shame that I call myself a you know, scholar of the humanities and a Catholic, and yet I had never read the Nicomachean Ethics. And so I got this copy of the Nicomachean Ethics, and I loved it. I thought it was so lucid, so clear. I really enjoyed it. And you'll notice, if you can zoom in with your eyeballs, the translation is by Robert C. Bartlett, along with Susan Collins. So this is one of his books. It's a good one. I recommend it. I see what this Aristotle guy is, is going on about. Uh, anyway, more recently, he's also translated Aristotle's Art of Rhetoric, which he'll be talking to you about today. And his most recent book was called Against Demagogues, What Aristophanes Can Teach Us About the Perils of Populism and the Fate of Democracy. So I hope you all give a warm welcome to Professor Bartlett. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here at Providence. We were going to do this earlier, and then, of course, the world shut down. So now that the world's more or less open, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I propose that we begin with a warm-up exercise. And that's a pop quiz. Faculty should feel free to participate. I'm going to give three quotations, and you can tell me the president who said it, although the, the quotation may not be while the, the person in question was actually in the office. It could have been before. Here's number one. Ready? All, quote, all this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. Who said it? Yes? Correct. Very impressive. Uh, number two. Quote, our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. Yes? George Bush, correct. Third, quote, it's, in, it's like in golf. A lot of people, I don't, want to, I don't want this to sound trivial, but a lot of people are switching to these really long putters, very unattractive. It's weird. You see these great players with these really long putters because they can't sink three-footers anymore, and I hate it. 
I am a traditionalist. I have so many fabulous friends who happen to be gay, but I am a traditionalist. This is on, this is on gay marriage. Who said it? Yeah. Yes? Correct. Wow, Providence College is three for three. This is very good. I'm impressed. It was Trump. Yes, it was Trump. Uh, you could conclude from this extremely small uh, uh, data sample that there's been a certain decline in the character of rhetoric. I, I wouldn't say that necessarily, but we'll see. I have two main tasks this afternoon with you before we open it up. The first is to give you a kind of quick and dirty introduction to the single most influential text that's ever been written on rhetoric, and that is Aristotle's Art of Rhetoric. Um, it's a difficult book in some ways, uh, but I'll try to be as clear and concise as I can. And then second, my second task will be to shift uh, and to say a few re remarks, at least, about uh, an interesting speech given by Barack Obama before, in 2008, before he was president, or shortly before he became president, because it, it exemplifies, in some, certain respects, some of what Aristotle says, all right? So my theme today is rhetoric, the art of rhetoric. What is that? Uh, I'll give you Aristotle's own definition. Quote, let rhetoric be a capacity to observe what admits of being persuasive in a given case. And as I'll try to, to bring out, the word persuasion or persuasive proves to be very important in the whole thing. The book, The Art of Rhetoric, was the first systematic treatment of the subject of rhetoric, at least it's come down to us. If there were prior ones, they've, they've been lost to history. And it was very influential in antiquity, both Greek and Roman, uh, the Christian and the Muslim Middle Ages, Cicero, Quintilian, Averroes, Al-Farabi, they all read this book, they commented on this book in some cases. It's been expanded in various ways, adapted and adopted, but the core of the book remains intact, I would say. It's been a kind of vessel that's hand, been handed down. Um, even the first great critic of Aristotle in modern times, Thomas Hobbes, you've heard of him, um, he says this about Aristotle, Hobbes does, about Aristotle. Quote, he was the worst teacher that ever was, the worst politician and the worst in ethics. Terrible. But, Hobbes made the very important qualification, quote, his rhetoric was rare. That was a good book. The rest is complete nonsense, the politics and the ethics and so on. But the, the rhetoric, that was something special. And uh, imitation is a serious, serious form of flattery because if you look at Hobbes' account in the Leviathan of the Passions, which he says is the center of his political science, his moral science. It, it largely comes from the second book of Aristotle's rhetoric. It's very much influenced uh, in any case. And much closer to home, some of you may know the, know the name of the German thinker Martin Heidegger. And Heidegger, too, was very impressed by Aristotle's rhetoric in his big book, Being in Time. This is what, what Heidegger says, quote, Aristotle investigated the passions in the second book of his rhetoric. Contrary to the traditional orientation of the concept of rhetoric, according to which it is some kind of discipline, Aristotle's rhetoric must be understood as the first systematic hermeneutic of the everydayness of being with one another. This is Heideggerian jargon. Publicness as the kind of being of the they not only has its attunedness, it uses moods and makes it for itself. The speaker speaks to it and from it. He needs understanding of the possibility of mood in order to arouse and direct it in the right way. Again, that's a kind of very highfalutin way of saying that Aristotle in this book lays out the passions. And that is the medium to speak to, to ordinary people in ordinary circumstances. I'll say a little bit more about that later. So let me just turn to kind of sketch the kinds of rhetoric according to Aristotle um, and the three proofs or modes of persuasion, as they're called. More about that in a minute. So in Book 1, Chapter 3, Aristotle says very simply, there are three kinds of rhetoric. And he means this to be exhaustive. These are not examples of rhetoric. These are the three kinds of rhetoric. So the first is deliberative, the second judici judicial, and the third epideictic, sometimes called display rhetoric. Yeah? So let me just say a word about each of these. Deliberative rhetoric, according to Aristotle, issues in speeches of exhortation or dissuasion. Let's do this. Let's not do that. Yeah? either to pursue or to shun a given course of action, and it's most concerned with some future good. So think of every, almost every speech, say, in, in any legislative assembly. Let's uh, revive the Iran deal, let's kill the Iran deal. Well, that'd be the executive, not the legislative. Any deliberative body, any political assembly where they have to decide about some future policy is deliberative rhetoric. Second, maybe and more obviously, judicial rhetoric 
is speeches of accusation or defense. It deals with questions of justice and injustice, guilt or innocent, and it's most concerned with the past. Where, where were you on August the 18th, uh, 2021? Were you or were you not in the liquor store? Yeah. So it, it has its proper home in some sort of courtroom. And then third, epideictic or display rhetoric, issues in speeches of blame or praise. Uh, the classic example of epideictic rhetoric would be a funeral oration. Yeah. You come to praise someone who has died. That's epideictic rhetoric. Um, and although Aristotle says epideictic speeches can deal with any time period, he says they mostly deal with the present now. So it's a very neat schema that Aristotle lays out. Yeah? There's three kinds of speeches or sets of speeches, exhortation or dissuasion, accusation or defense, and praise and blame. And there's three subject matters, the good and the bad, the just and the unjust, and the noble and the base, or the admirable and the shameful. And three time periods, future, past, present. So that's the, that's the kind of three kinds of rhetoric, very simple. Good. Now I want to turn to what he calls proofs, or as I translate it, modes of persuasion, pistis. What's this? It means trust or conviction or belief that something is so, yeah? And I prefer the translation modes of persuasion rather than proof. Why? Because proof, at least to my ears, suggests like a geometric proof, rock solid demonstration that X is so. And as I'll try to show you, that's not what rhetoric does, at least not essentially, yeah? So he says there's three kinds of modes of persuasion. The first has to do with the character of the speaker. In my introduction, uh, uh, my, my uh, scholarly credentials were mentioned. This is to get you to believe in my character with regard to, the, the, at least with this task. Um, the character of the speaker or the ethos in Greek as it's conveyed in and through the speech. So if it's a, a technical question, how to dispose of nuclear waste properly. Okay. Well, if the guy has a PhD from MIT and so on, that the character of the speaker would come through the speech and you'd be more inclined to believe him or her. Um, that's the first. The second is the passion of the audience. The, the passion uh, that you undergo because of the speech. You're moved to anger, you want to get those bastards by the end of the speech. Or pity, sympathy. That is a mode of persuasion according to Aristotle, um, pathos. And then finally the speech itself, the logos he calls it the character of it, the syllogism, the, the nature of the syllogism, the premises and then the conclusion, yeah? So we have in Greek, ethos, pathos, and logos, what somebody called the three musketeers of rhetoric. So if the speaker can convince the audience that his character is sound, honest, uh, well-intentioned, knowledgeable, and if the speaker can move the audience in some way, above all, either toward or away from anger, and finally, if the argument as an argument proves persuasive, then conviction, pistis, will arise in the audience. And you can use one or two or three of those. Perhaps all three together would be most uh, uh, persuasive. But I think this shows why the, the word proof is misleading. Because if I can get you angry at my opponent, if I'm giving a deliberative speech, if I can get you angry at my opponent so you vote my way, I haven't proved anything. But I have instilled in you a conviction that my policy is better. You may think I've proved something. Bartlett nailed that case. I'm so, and I'm so angry at the other person who opposes him. But it, strictly speaking, I haven't proved it. But I've moved you to believe that it's so. And it's at this point I think we have to face a, a, a fact about rhetoric. That rhetoric has a certain odor about it, a bad reputation that attaches to rhetoric, both in classical times and in modern times, too. Think of the following phrases. Highly rhetorical, near rhetoric, nice rhetoric, but these are not compliments, generally speaking. So much smoke and mirrors, puffery, more style and substance. That's typically what we mean by the word. Or think of the, the, the ubiquity of the word narrative, narratives. Yeah? The narrative coming out of the White House, or X doesn't fit with the narrative. I think that means a speech which the person saying it doesn't think is true, but wants you to believe it, pushing a certain agenda. Now, what's the source of rhetoric's bad reputation, or at least complicated reputation? I think it can be boiled down to this simple fact, that we human beings can be, be persuaded by something other than the truth. 
and we can remain unpersuaded by the truth. Yeah? And it's possible for some clever types to exploit this unhappy fact for their own gain and maybe our detriment. Uh, let me quote some lines from the great tragic uh, poet Euripides, which Aristotle quotes in the rhetoric. But if, in fact, it's possible among mortals to make false pronouncements persuasively, you ought to believe the opposite, too, that mortals are often not persuaded by the truth. Now, in classical times, the criticism of, of rhetoric, I think, is Plato's Gorgias. Maybe some of you have read this. And I'll just summarize Socrates' core of the criticism. It's this. It's no art. It's not a techne. It's just a knack. Yeah? It persuades without teaching. It's not interested in the truth. And he says uh, there in the Gorgias that, uh, he says famously, that rhetoric is the counterparty, the antistrophos of fancy cookery, gourmet cooking. Just as gourmet cookery flatters the soul, have another pastry, you know. So rhetoric, he says, flatters the soul. Enter Aristotle. This is the immediate background of the rhetoric. Um, and I would draw your attention to the simplest thing, which is the title. The title is The Art of Rhetoric. So in a way, he already throws down the gauntlet. Socrates said, this isn't even an art. And he says, no, it is an art, the art of rhetoric. And the first sentence of the book is this. Rhetoric is a counterpart of dialectic or logic. Counterpart, antistrophos, it's the same word. Socrates had said, it's just the counterpart to fancy cookery that flatters the body. And Aristotle says, no, no, it's a counterpart to logic. So he begins already by implicitly, at least, rejecting Socrates' uh, criticism of rhetoric, yeah? And the first three chapters, which I think in some ways are the most difficult of the book, are devoted to answering the question of what it is, of what rhetoric is. And he begins already from the title on with a kind of elevation or defense of rhetoric. And I want to suggest that his defense of rhetoric has itself a kind of rhetoric to it, yeah? I'll do this, this, this uh, fairly quickly. Uh, he begins by criticizing certain unnamed technical writers who are responsible, apparently, for the bad reputation of rhetoric. He says, among other things, this, that these people have neglected the proofs, yeah, which I, Aristotle, am laying out so clearly in my book. This is the core of the art of rhetoric, and they've neglected it too much. Yes? Second, he says, they're concerned with the manipulation of the passions, anger, pity, fear, and so on. And Aristotle says rather vividly, that's like taking a ruler and bending it before you use it. Because the judges, you're manipulating the very judges you want to use. That's the criticism. Third, he says, these uh, unnamed writers are too much concerned with rhetoric in the courtroom, judicial rhetoric. Whereas they should pay more attention to political rhetoric, deliberative rhetoric. That, he says, is nobler and more public spirited. So they're always, you know, 98% is just trying to get somebody off on a charge. And this is not good. So to repeat, Aristotle begins by defending rhetoric, I think, and he almost immediately traces the roots of the problem with rhetoric, its reputation, to these writers who've distorted the thing. They haven't treated it properly. But, and this is a strange thing, once you read Aristotle's whole book, which isn't all that long, you will see that Aristotle includes as one of the three legitimate kinds of rhetoric, as I've already said, judicial, and he treats it at the greatest length. He said that these other people give it too much attention, but he gives it a lot of attention, too. Um, and he gives a long, as I've already said, treatment of the passions. And that's partly for its own sake, but it is partly, explicitly, to rouse these passions or quell them in an audience, quiet them down. Yeah? And thirdly, finally, he, he also is very concerned with the parts of the speech as he criticizes these, these unnamed technical writers for also being concerned with the parts of the speech. So what does this mean? In other words, the criticisms here are somewhat overblown. The writers may stress too much, maybe, what is nonetheless a real part of rhetoric, as Aristotle himself acknowledges. Um, and so I do think there's a kind of rhetoric already in his presentation of rhetoric. He then turns to give his own account of why it's a good thing, why we need it, yeah? Um, and he says a, a number of things. First, he says that rhetoric can come to the defense of what is true and what's just. And he notes in, in making this argument that if you think that something is true and will therefore triumph in the marketplace of ideas, if you think the cause you serve is a just one and therefore it will triumph in the world, you are being naive. 
and that rhetoric should step in to make sure that what's true and what's just will triumph. Second, he says, and this is, has a lot of implications, I think, for democracy today, he says, just because something is true, we have a science or a knowledge of something, science, he says. Science is not necessarily more persuasive among some people than rhetoric is. Teaching, he says, in some cases isn't possible. And so, you know, we're often exhorted today in and after the COVID period, follow the science, follow the science. Well, Aristotle says, I'm sorry, but that's not enough. Because even if you have the science, it will be unpersuasive to many people. And rhetoric needs to enter that, enter that gap. Fauci needs better rhetoric. I think everyone probably could agree to that. He also says that rhetoric should be able to persuade of opposites. Now, what does that mean? He means this. You should never, well, what's the opposite of just? Unjust. If you think your client is innocent and you're working to that end, you need to know not just the arguments to establish his innocence, but the arguments what? That might be used to establish his guilt. Or to give an example from the first book of, of Plato's Re uh, Republic. Everything's going hunky-dory. Socrates and the kids are, are agreed that justice is this and this, and it's all wonderful and so on. And then a very rude man named Thrasymachus interrupts and says, I'm sorry, this is complete nonsense. Justice is for suckers. And the, the Republic wouldn't be the book that it is had not Thrasymachus so rudely interrupted. And that forces Socrates to take up arguments he would never have otherwise taken up. And Aristotle says the same thing with regard to rhetoric. You need to understand the opposite arguments. Even if you're convinced in your bones that they're wrong or even ugly, you need to understand them because how else could you effectively thwart them if you don't understand them? So you need to see the power of that position. This is a lesson, I think, also for today. Um, and finally, he notes, <clears throat> he says this. So these are rhetoric serving a good cause, but he also says if it's a shameful thing, not to be able to defend your body with your fists, isn't it even more shameful not to be able to defend yourself with speech, which is, after all, more human than even the body? So in other words, rhetoric could be useful in self-defense. All right, so let's pause for a minute. The book begins with a praise or elevation of rhetoric, I've suggested. It is an art, and it's akin to logic. It's pretty good. But these technical writers have muddied the waters. Yeah, they've distorted what rhetoric is or what it should be. But to repeat, Aristotle will later, in effect, grant quite a lot to these writers. The importance of passion, for example, and the proper organization of the speech, and so on. But don't these arguments, if you take them together, make something plain? Both his defense and his having to concede something to the enemies. I think it makes this plain, that rhetoric is questionable. What's true and just will not necessarily win, he says. Science or knowledge in the strict sense will, sense will not necessarily be persuasive. Or the other side of the same coin, what's false may be persuasive. Can't persuasive speech be used as much to promote what's false and unjust as to defeat those things? And I think the answer one has to give is yes. It is true. My general suggestion is this, that Aristotle can't deny, in fact, he has to grant that rhetoric is a loaded gun. And loaded guns can be used for very fine causes and for horrific causes. And rhetoric is the same. Rhetoric is the same. It can be used for ill just as easily, maybe more easily, than for good. But rhetoric, whether we like it or not, is a necessary fact of human life together and democratic life in particular. We could wish it away, but I think for so long as human beings have gathered together in groups, We've tried through speech to convince one another of something. That's rhetoric. It's very simple rhetoric, yeah? Um, let me say a few words about um, the three modes of persuasion again, the passion, the character, and the logos, yeah? All this is taken up in book two. On passion, here's Aristotle's definition. The passions are all those things on account of which people, undergoing a change, alter the judgments they make things that pain and pleasure accompany. For example, anger, pity, fear, and the other things of that sort, as well as their opposite. Now, he mentions 16 passions in all, but he doesn't discuss them all. The first passion that he mentions, the one that he gives most extensive treatment to, is anger. 
and its opposite, gentleness. Any guess why? Yes. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's so powerful. And there is a version, a kind of anger, which is moral anger, you know? You may be in a hurry and you, you're late for class and you, as you're rushing out of your dorm, you stub your toe on the chair and you address the chair. Yes, my, this is a bad chair. But you're not really angry at the chair, not really. Whereas, uh, there is a different kind of anger, he, and he has a very nice, a very precise account of this, that the, the most potent cause of anger, which he discusses at some length, is manifest disrespect, or slighting, he calls it. In other words, dissing someone on the part, uh, on the part of someone for whom that dissing is totally inappropriate. That makes our blood boil. Yeah. Um, and I think the reason why he treats this first and at greatest length is it's so potent politically, both as a tool to use, dangerous, but there it is, but also if you can calm the, the audience down. You've misunderstood something. You know, you've perhaps have been angry and someone talks you down. That's not what he meant, or you misheard. He was, that wasn't even addressed to you. Oh, and then you, you, you feel yourself deflating a little. This is part of the, the, the effect of rhetoric properly used, at least, yeah? Um, he then turns to character, ethos. Again, to repeat, if, you can con if the speaker can convey through the speech that I have a fine character or some quality that you admire that's relevant to the speech, then that will be uh, uh, very important. And he does an odd thing. He says, I'm going to mostly treat character in terms of age, the young, the middle-aged, and the elderly. So that if you have to address a group of the AARP, your speech would surely be different in many important respects than if you were addressing, say, a freshman class at Providence College. And because this is one of my favorite sections of the, of the art of rhetoric, and because it's my talk and I can do what I like, I'm going to beg your indulgence, and I'm going to read a, a few of the passages of his, of his account of the character of young people, namely you. And you could tell me whether or not human nature has changed dramatically since the time he wrote these things. Now, the characters of the young are marked by desire. And they are such as to do the things they desire. Of the bodily desires, they're especially apt to follow the one for sex. And in this, they lack self-restraint. Some of you are looking at your shoes at the moment. This is a very strange thing. When it comes to the desires, the young are easily changeable and fickle. And although they desire intensely, they cease to desire rapidly. For their wishes are keen but not great, like the thirst and hungry, hunger of the sickly. Um, they're characterized by sp spiritedness. They're kind of feisty and a sharp temper. And they are such as to follow impulse. They also to succumb to spiritedness on account of their love of honor and so on. They have not a cynical character, but a naive one, because they've not yet observed many wicked things. They're also readily trusting because they've not yet suffered many deceptions. They're hopeful, too. Young people are hopeful. And um, because, like those who are drunk, the young are by nature hot-blooded. And at the same time, they've not yet suffered many failures. Being young is like being on a constant drunk. And then when you hit middle age, there's a hangover that comes. But that's for another day. In fact, they live for the most part on hope. Since hope belongs to the future, memory to times gone by. And for the young, the future is vast the past brief. On the first day, so to speak, you can remember nothing but hope for anything. They're also readily deceived and so on. Um, he, he talks about how much they love friendship and how important friendship is. Um, they also suppose that they know everything and emphatically affirm it, since this is a cause of doing everything to excess. The injustices they commit are traceable to insolence, not to malice. They're also given to pitying, because they suppose they are all fine people and better than they are in fact. They're also fond of laughter, and hence are witty, for wittiness is educated insolence. A very beautiful line. Such, then, is the character of the young. Thank you for indulging me with that. I, I like it very much. Um, now, of course, I'm leaving out a great deal in, the, in his account. Uh, he speaks, for example, of the great effectiveness of examples, of metaphors, 
of things that make a vimid, uh, an image come vividly to mind. So when I said that rhetoric is a loaded gun, it's a metaphor, which he approves. I mean, I don't know if he approves of that metaphor. He didn't know what guns were. But uh, metaphors in general can be very effective and so on. Um, perhaps I could give one quick example uh, that, that, that is somewhat controversial of the manner of rhetorical argument. Uh, the, word na the phrase natural law, which is very important in Catholic theology, Stoicism, and so on, it's a contradiction in terms in Greek thought. There's nature and there's law or custom, but these, there's, these things don't go together. But in one place in the rhetoric, he does speak of natural law. And so people have read this and said, my goodness, he founded the idea of natural law. I don't think that's true. All that he does there is, is suggest that human beings have a sense that there's the positive law, the written law, whatever Congress produces, and some standard above it in the light of which we could say that's an unjust law. And the reason why he appeals to natural law here is clearly for a rhetorical purpose. Namely, if you're in a courtroom and the law, the written law, is against your case, well, what should you appeal to? The natural law, or natural justice, he often says. However, he says, if the written law favors your case, don't mention natural law, mention the written law. And say written law is everything. We have to pay attention to this. So it shows, in a way, his how should we call it, his flexibility. And I don't think it's true that he's the founder of, of natural law. Um, let me conclude my treatment of Aristotle before I turn to Barack Obama, just by saying this. Um, I think what is he doing in this book? He wants to defend rhetoric. There's a long tradition also of the criticism of rhetoric, starting not least in Plato. So he wants to defend it. It really is an art, or it could be, and it could be made more precise. But if I'm right, and that he acknowledges, at least implicitly, that it is a potentially dangerous thing, is he then, in effect, building a gun with a better sight on it? You know, isn't this a somewhat dangerous thing to do? And I think the answer, at least in part, the first answer is yes. But what is he to do? There will be a kind of rhetoric. There was rhetoric before him, and there will be rhetoric after him. And so what I think he tries to do is to bring such clarity and precision as he can to the thing itself, to make of it a genuine art, and then exhort us to use it responsibly, by, precisely by acknowledging how, how easily it is to misuse. And one other thing occurred to me as I studied the book, that if, if one becomes a student of rhetoric, then this good consequence could arise you could become a much more thoughtful, a much more sensitive consumer of rhetoric, if that's the right term. In other words, you would be less likely to become carried away, say, by appeals to your anger or your pity. Okay? Uh, I was once teaching this section, and I began the class by saying to my students at BC, first I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not well prepared today. But I, had a, I bought a puppy last week, and I'm so, the puppy's been very sick. In fact, I had to take it to the vet and have it put down this morning. So I'm just, and the class was just completely silent. BC students are very nice. And then one student started laughing because he realized that the subject of the class for that day was the passions and the use of passions in rhetoric, that I had invoked in the class pity. They felt sorry for me. He's unprepared, it's not going to be a very good class, but you know, take it easy on him because he's had this terrible place puppy died. And then we discussed that. And, and so if you become alive to the fact that a speaker is starting to move you in some way, you could begin to think, wait a minute, how is this happening? And it could be for perfectly legitimate reasons, to be sure, but you become more self-aware of the speeches that are going into your head. And I think that's one very good, good um, um, consequence of the study of the art of rhetoric, yeah? So that with or without his intervention, there's going to be rhetoric. But I think he thought it was a fascinating thing to try to understand as what it is, which permitted him, for example, to give his longest account of the passions. It's not in De Anima, it's not in the ethics, it's here. And to that extent, he does intervene in the public square and try within the limits of possible, I think, to elevate and refine the rhetoric that we cannot but use. All right. Now I want to turn fairly briefly to, to discuss a speech that uh, has always struck me from the time I heard it 
and I've since read it and so on. And that's, uh, and I know that some of you have just seen this speech, which is very helpful. Uh, Barack Obama's A More Perfect Union speech, uh, delivered in March of 2008. So he was not yet, he wasn't president, and he had not yet secured the nomination of the Democratic Party for president. In fact, and this is relevant to the speech, he was in a very tough battle with Hillary Clinton for that nomination. And in the course of that battle, videotapes had surfaced of Reverend Jeremiah Wright of the Trinity Church in Chicago, who had been the uh, Obama family pastor for decades. He married them, he baptized their children, and so on. And in these videos, Jeremiah Wright giving a kind of fire and brimstone speech about the ills of the United States in very incendiary, inflammatory terms, saying, in effect, that 9-11 was deserved, we only got what was coming to us, God damn America, and so on. I won't repeat it all, but, uh, and this just exploded, as you can imagine. This was the pastor who had guided Obama for decades. So what does Obama believe? Does he believe these things too? And this brought his campaign to a screeching halt. And so the speech is more than a speech. Most speeches are more than a speech. It had the practical purpose of attempting to save his candidacy, period. Nothing less than that. But he used this opportunity, it seems to me, to give, uh, and this, of course, this galvanized national attention. He was getting more attention than he'd ever had, and it was negative, or at least question, deeply questioning of who he was. He also used the speech as an opportunity to give a kind of biography or autobiography. This is who I am. And second, he used it as an opportunity to lay out his understanding of race in America. It was his clearest, I think, most powerful statement on that. So these things all coalesced, a statement of a biography, a statement of his views about race, he being biracial, as you know, and the practical purpose of trying to salvage this campaign. And um, it's, it's a very well constructed speech, it seems to me. And I just want to go through parts of it with you. He begins the following way. By the way, the speech was delivered in Philadelphia, not, I'm sure, by accident. He begins in the following way, quote, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. What's that? I mean, where's that from? The Constitution of the United States, exactly. And he says this, 221 years ago in a hall that stands across the street, He's in Philly. A group of men gathered and, with these simple words, launched America's improbable experiment in democracy. And he goes on. In other words, the question raised by these videos is, does it, to put it very crudely, does Obama hate the United States? Does he think it's rotten to the core? And so he begins by quoting, literally, the Constitution. And he praises the Constitution and what it constructed and the country that it, it, it put together. But he adds this, of course, the answer to the slavery question was already embedded within our Constitution, a Constitution that had at its very core the idea of equal citizenship under the law, a Constitution that promised its people liberty and justice and a union that could be and should be perfected over time. So he mentions, I skipped, I'm skipping some things, but he mentions the original sin of slavery, so the Constitution, a, a great document, slavery. But then he says the solution to the problem was in the Constitution itself. That, it seems to me, is a very important argument that he makes. It means, in other words, you don't have to drag in foreign ideas or principles. No, that the document itself, the ideas in the document itself were sufficient to correct the thing itself. Now, he adds immediately, of course, that this is an ongoing labor. We're not finished. We're not even close to finished. And so he will, both here and at the end of the speech, where he comes back to the Constitution very skillfully, introduces his own campaign. And in a way, this campaign is meant to help fulfill the original promise of the document. But it's a very good argument, it seems to me. I think it's true. But in addition to being true, uh, it's, it says, tells us something about him, that he reveres the Constitution. He acknowledges, of course, the problem of slavery and its after effects. Jim Crow, he mentions explicitly. But he argues, at least, or he states unambiguously, that the, the principles of the Constitution 
solve the problems of the founder. It's a, it's a very good argument. This belief comes from my unyielding faith in the decency and generosity of the American people. Again, a very strong statement. And then he pivots and says, but it also comes from my own American story. So there, there he introduces the bi biographical or autobiographical part of the speech. I am the son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas. So in a way, he embodies, literally embodies uh, the, the racial problem or the racial uh, makeup of the United States, put it that way. Yeah? And he goes on to say how much he owed to his family, especially his white grandfather and grandmother. The grandfather served in World War II. They essentially raised him. Um, it's, uh, it's a story that hasn't made me the most conventional candidate. Um, but it is a story that has seared into my genetic makeup. And he says at one point, this story could not have happened in any other country on the face of the earth, you know, that I could be a serious candidate for the presidency, given my background. Yeah? And at one point, he says the following. It's a remarkably frank speech in, in some ways. On one end of the spectrum, we've heard in my campaign, the implication that my candidacy is somehow an exercise in affirmative action that it's based solely on the desire of, of wide-eyed liberals to purchase recon racial reconciliation on the cheap. He's alluding here, and it will become explicit later, to a remark that Geraldine Ferraro had made. She was a very prominent figure in the Democratic Party. She'd been VP candidate on the Mondale ticket, lost. But she, and she was very much supporting Hillary. And she had said, I, I don't know the quote, but it's something like, Obama would not be getting the attention is if he weren't black. This is an affirmative action candidacy. So he alludes to that here. And she's very much of the, you know, the left, the Democratic Party. Um, on the other end, still quoting, we've heard my former pastor, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, use incendiary language to express views that have the potential not only to widen the right, racial divide, divide, excuse me, but views that denigrate both the greatness and goodness of our nation, that rightly offend white and black. He proceeds to give very tough criticism of Wright, my former pastor. He's wrong. He, he deeply misunderstands the nature of the United States. It's divisive and so on. And it looks like he's just going to throw him to the curb. But he says, I could no more disown him than I can dis uh, disown my own family, which is unexpected. It looks like he's going to say, yeah, he, this guy's crazy. But he says, no. Uh, he's a part of my family. And there were beautiful things that happened in the church, as well as things that I deeply disagreed with. And he draws a very interesting parallel between his pastor and his grandmother. Yeah? Um, and he says at one point that I heard her say things about black men that made me cringe. Again, she was a white woman. Um, and so he, this was a, a passage that made some commentators say that he threw his grandmother under the bus in this speech. But I don't know whether that's fair. He draws a parallel, in other words. They're both flawed people, and they're both flawed on racial questions. But they're also good people, too, and I love them both, and I owe them both a great deal. And that's a very, I think it's a very effective and, and surprising move in the speech, if I could put it this way. Um, imperfect as he may be, he's been like family to me. He strengthened my faith, officiated my wedding, and so on. I can no more disown him than I can disown the black community. Um, the next thing that, that Obama does is to try to explain to a national audience why you have people like my grandmother and why you have people like Jeremiah Wright. And in the case of Wright, he goes through uh, fairly briefly, but I think powerfully, uh, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of Jim Crow, and so on. And that these problems have metastasized in certain ways and lead to anger and resentment, the kind of things that you would hear in a Sunday sermon from Wright, sometimes. But he adds something else. In fact, a similar anger exists within segments of the white community. Most working class and middle class white Americans don't feel that they've been particularly privileged by their race. This is 2008. Their experience is the immigrant experience. As far as they're concerned, no one's handed them anything. They built it from scratch. They've worked hard all their lives, many times only to see their jobs shipped overseas or their pension dumped after a lifetime of work. Um, so when they are told, to bus their children to a school across town. When they hear that an African American is getting an advantage in landing a good job or a spot in good college because of an injustice that they themselves never committed, 
when they're told that their fears about crime in urban neighborhoods are somehow prejudiced, resentment builds over time. So he gives a very powerful genealogy, if you like, of, of black anger and resentment and white anger and resentment. And it's, it's, a, it's a sympathetic portrait, even if he doesn't agree with the conclusions on each side. Um, and in fact, he gives some very powerful, I think today, controversial advice to members of the black community. For the African American community, that path means embracing the burdens of our past without becoming victims of our past. It means continuing to insist on a full measure of justice in every aspect of American life, but it also means binding our particular grievances um, to the larger aspirations of all Americans. It means taking full responsibility for our own lives by demanding more from our fathers and spending more time with our children and reading to them and teaching them that while they may face challenges and discrimination in their own lives, they must never succumb to despair or cynicism. Remarkably tough, frank talk. I'm not sure that a candidate in 2021 could or would say these things. So this speech is an interesting speech for many reasons, and I, I, I'm sure I haven't done it full justice. Um, it's a very good example, however, it seems to me, of the Aristotelian mode of persuasion of EFA. That is to say, the speech, in part due to its frankness, conveys a sense to a national audience of the character of the man speaking it. And the character of the man speaking it could, simply could not agree and does not agree with the sentiments expressed so notoriously by Jeremiah Wright. And so in a, in a relatively short speech, um, Obama managed to pack in a great deal with a kind of, I think, a very great skill. Um, let, me, let me stop here, but because I don't want to go on too long. Um, and I'd be happy to take any of your questions, comments, protests, either about Aristotle, Obama, or anything else. We'll have, oh, yeah, we should. But, but having to ask them to clap strips the clap, clapping of any meaning, so. <laughs> I was going to say, before I, I so rudely interrupted by Jim, we, uh, yeah, we're beginning the, the Q&A and it's great if we can kick things off with students. And I already see two student hands that were raised. Just give me, whenever, you know, I'll keep track of hands, but let me run the microphone to you so that your words can be immortalized on tape as well. Um, Olivia, did you have something else? Okay, and then Tim. I kind of just thought of this, so apologies if it's not very um, coherent. But um, I feel like there's a value. I just wrote this on the drive down. <laughs> <so much enough. laughs> great, great, great. Um, I feel like there's like a unanimous value of an individual who's short and sweet and is based on actions rather than words. And I think there is kind of a persuasion in that person itself as like a simple minded, um, strong individual over someone with like false flattery and like the stereotype of rhetoric. And I was just wondering. Um, considering your knowledge on Aristotle, um, would he view this implistic and like short and sweet individual who listens and speaks only when needed as a strong rhetorical tactic in itself? And I know that's paradoxical, but would Aristotle find this to be a rhetorical tactic to avoid rhetoric? <laughs> a rhetorical tactic to avoid rhetoric, that's a clever phrase. Um, First, he does say, um, keep things simple. If you have syllogism upon syllogism upon syllogism, it, the head begins to spin rather quickly. He says, assume that the judge, meaning the audience, is a simple fellow. That cuts to the chase. He, he, uh, I mentioned the effectiveness of examples. And he also has a long discussion of maxims, you know, sayings that some, somehow capture something and that are memorable. Um, in, in our time, I assume this is the influence of the advertising industry. Build back better, you know, these stupid phrases, but they are memorable in some ways, meant to somehow capture something, the branding of some, something like that. Um, 
Yeah, but the difficulty, so, so in a way, he, he acknowledges your point. Keep it simple, straightforward. Um, vivid images through speech and so on. But he wouldn't stress, as I think you did at least at the beginning, action so much because we are, by nature, political animals and we are rational animals, which is to say we have speech. That's what reason means, logos. And so we're either condemned or blessed, depending on how you want to look at it, to make arguments to one another. Yeah. Um, and, and that's an unavoidable uh, feature of, of, our, of the human situation. We can't just grunt or point. We tend to make arguments. And in Aristotle's day, of course, there's a, a long tradition of, of incredibly complicated speeches. Uh, uh, Pericles' funeral oration is recorded in Thucydides. It's a very complicated speech in some ways. And, and they must have had more of an oral tradition than we do, where you could sit for 45 minutes and be wowed by a, well, you just did, but uh, sit for 45 minutes and, and, and follow a speech. That's a, a, a talent that I think we don't have so much. Sound bites, you know. People decry the advent of sound bites, but we're, it's not clear we're doing anything about it. There was a part of your question I've missed. Do you want to follow up? At least I think you might. Um, I think you, you answered it well. It's just, um, is it a tactic in itself? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. If it's done self-consciously or, or deliberately. I, every, every time you, a serious speech, if you stand up and start speaking, there should be a purpose. And any time you analyze political speeches especially, what's the purpose behind the speech? I tried to lay out Obama's. First, to save his campaign. And then other things followed from that. But there was a simple practical purpose to that speech, which worked, by the way. Um, and, and so you have to begin with that. And, and depending on the audience, the, the character of the speech should follow from that. And it might be, therefore, very simple, very direct. Three minutes, you sit down. And you end with a, a zinger at the end, which would be memorable. It's kind of like a strategic pause in a speech. You don't keep talking throughout a whole speech or eventually the rhythm gets lost. So maybe that's what another angle to the question. But I had a different. But silence could also be a rhetorical device. Aristotle doesn't say that, but it seems to me true. Yeah. Yeah. I had a different question now. All right. Um, you mentioned in your response to the previous question the use of sound bites and the use of slogans. And it seems like in our modern climate, a lot of political talk is reduced to that. Yes. How would Aristotle provide us a way out of it, if at all? I mean, there's one massive thing, one obvious thing between his time and ours, and that's technology. And many people have written about, decried the use of, the, the advent of technology in this regard, that it, it tends to make speech quick, easy, and superficial. And so you can have mobs on Twitter or whatever it is, you know. People outraged, they, they hide behind a, a, an on-name moniker and they say the most outrageous things to other people which they would never say in public to their face. So it encourages also a kind of cowardice and coarseness, not a very attractive combination. That he just didn't know of. I mean, it, it didn't exist. He does in one place anticipate theoretically the possibility that looms could move themselves and, and Musical instruments could play themselves. But he clearly thought that was a bad idea. The use of, of philosophy or science in the name of, of what we call technology. So that's a very long and difficult question. But, but that's the most obvious difference. And, and, and how do you put that toothpaste back in the tube? I don't, I don't think one can. So you, you make the best of it, I suppose. And there are arguments, there are responsible people in the public square who make these arguments, saying technology is not all wonderful, actually. There are many such arguments, and I think that's probably a good thing. I'm old enough that when I went to college, I wrote my papers on a typewriter. You could Google that. Yep. And then when I was in graduate school, I had a Mac. So in a way, I was present at the birth, at the transformation. I didn't have a cell phone until I was in my 40s. My dad beats you on that. He had, didn't get a cell phone really till his 50s. He did. <laughs> Not a good one. <laughs> um, 
but it has it has an odd effect on me too. Yep. And I didn't grow up with one as as I assume most of you did. It it is kind of hypnotic. And it's it's bad. Or at least it's a very mixed bag, let's say that. I, I'm going back to the first question, which I may have misunderstood it, but I'm going to go. It, it makes me think of an idea. There is a kind of a rhetoric, which is an anti-rhetoric. Yeah. Right? Socrates obviously does it in the beginning of the Apology. St. Paul does it. And, and it. Well, no, where you simply say, I'm not as sophisticated as, uh, yeah. you know, I'm just an old country lawyer, you know, if it's an American thing. <laughs> and then you use that in order to make your argument. So it's a, and you know, I, I may not know all the fancy phrases and da 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 The beginning of the apology. <laughs> exactly. I'm not a clever speaker. Exactly. <laughs> but and that, that itself is, is an example of clever speech. <laughs> exactly. That's a, that's a, so I've always been curious because, you know, Plato, as far as I understand him, believes uh, rightly, or at least you, you mentioned this, that rhetoric really is the enemy of philosophy because uh, philosophy in some way should be unadorned enough that the, it's the argument that's carrying the day and not the certain techniques of the speaker. Right. Right. Um, but there's no way to get her out of because even that, even the unadorned speech, which claims it is, you know, is clearly as a tactic right. to be unadored, as if this is objective, dispassionate rhetoric, and therefore the conclusion follows necessarily, blah, 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 is itself a rhetorical right. uh, device. I, I don't know if Plato ever deals with that. But you no, said I, agree, I agree with everything you say, and I'll even go one step further, that the, the dialogue that attacks rhetoric, Gor the Gorgias, ends with this fantastic display of rhetoric, a myth, you know, this dazzling vision of the afterlife and so on. And, and there is a genuine and I think sincere criticism of rhetoric, and in particular, the Gorgian kind of rhetoric. There is something irresponsible about what Gorgias does. He, he teaches more or less openly, too openly, the inadequacy or the foolishness of justice and the superiority of the unjust course. And, and Socrates and Plato, I think, are extremely critical of that. And th they slap him down in various ways. But then again, we see in that dialogue a responsible rhetoric, or what Plato at least would say is a responsible rhetoric. So I agree with your main point, if I understand your main point, that, that it's in a way inescapable. Um, that we are not logic chopping machines. Uh, and we can, we can understand <laughs> syllogisms and detect their logical flaws, and we should do that. But that's only the beginning of the story, right? And so, yeah, I agree with you that there's... The denunciation of rhetoric probably is itself rhetorical. I mean, I tried to argue that in Aristotle when he says, there are these bad writers and they've done a terrible thing. But then, if you take a certain distance, he does the exact same thing. He tells us how to manipulate the passions. This is how, this is what anger is, and this is what causes it. So there's something overblown, as I said, about the, the, the critique of rhetoric at the beginning, which is not to say that there isn't a critique. There is. Well, if I can follow up on that. Yes. <coughs> we're all, anyone who teaches is attentive or should be attentive to this problem because yes. you're controlling the classroom. You have the most likely the greatest power of eloquence and all that kind of thing, most likely. Um, so, but at the same time, you're not interested, at least you shouldn't be, of manipulating your students, manipulating your audience. You should, you should and here's a, a platonic critique, right? You should be using your speech and your reason in order to gain truth. Yes. And so I've often thought about, well, what is the, because there's no getting out of rhetoric. That's that's impossible for human beings. In what way does one use rhetorical devices in order to um, give your audience a chance to, to break free of your own control over yeah. the material, to enter into a critical way so that they can detect or, or they can come to the truth themselves? 
thought about that? Yes, it's a very difficult question. Um, I would say a couple of things off the top of my head. First, one is that if you have a frank discussion about rhetoric, then the audience, your fellow, your students, your fellow students, could become more reflective on what's happening in the classroom. That's one thing. And second, I would say it's just if there are some students who, for whatever reason, their nature or their upbringing or both together, want to get to the bottom of things. They want to figure something out. Does God exist? If he does, what's his char character, qu quality, and so on? That that's a question that the student has to, wants to get to the bottom of on his or her own. Then I think what we can do is, is help them to understand what the big questions are, some of the, the most impressive, serious answers have been, and then, in a way, stand back. You play lion tamer, in a way. Um, so some, some combination of those things, yeah. But of course, you're right that we use rhetoric. We should use rhetoric in the classroom, especially beginning students. You have to begin where your audience is. You have to figure out where they are. Examples, humor, to draw them in. So especially if you're teaching Aristotle, which can be dry. I mean, you didn't hear me say that, but uh, it could appear dry. And so you have to bring them in in a certain way. But that, that's in a way a separate question. Um, thank you for everything you've been saying so far. I've been learning a lot. Um, but as we're discussing, I'm thinking about um, the connection or the role that philosophy plays in rhetoric. Um, and a lot of times philosophy is distinguished from rhetoric um, and they're two different things. Um, but I'm just interested in um, your stance on the role that philosophy does play in rhetoric. Yeah. Would you say that um, rhetorical strategies uh, are not useful or would be technically empty without that argument, without um, that logical argument? Um. Yeah, that too is a very difficult question. <laughs> Aristotle presents rhetoric as being f the stuff of rhetoric, the, the meat and potatoes, the content of rhetoric, is opinion. He's emphatic about that. Endoxa, the, the acceptable opinion in your audience. You, and he says you have to know what that is. That can be difficult to do, but you have to you know, you start from there. If you begin with premises that nobody in your audience accepts, it's going to be a long day. Whereas the stuff of the meat and potatoes of philosophy is, one hopes, argument and ultimately the truth, or some, some grasp of the truth, some glimpse of the truth. And he says, you know, it's possible to, to make an argument, of course, which is logically sound, invulnerable to attack. But it may not be very persuasive to the given audience. So in a way, he presents it a kind of chasm between philosophy on the one hand and rhetoric on the other. And that's, in a way, the power and the potential danger of rhetoric. It's not necessarily moored to the truth. It's persuasion. I, but through speech, I get you to believe X when 10 minutes ago you believed not X. I've moved your soul in a certain way. And that's a very great power. And again, he, he doesn't solve that problem by saying, well, if we could make rhetoric into philosophy, it would always be true. He doesn't say that, because I don't think he thinks it's possible. He does say, and I quoted him, that it should come to the defense of what's just and what's true. But that would require a, a rhetorician who has a great deal of self-awareness. And, and a, a kind of basic decency, too, I would add. And that it's, it's subservient to, it's a servant of those other higher things. It doesn't establish them or find them, but it, it, it serves them, or should. And you, one could say, well, it doesn't have to. And I would say, that's right. But that's, that's where we are as human beings. There are people around making false arguments that they know to be false for reasons of their own. And one, as I said, one of the reasons I think he wrote this book is to say, you know, wake up and smell the coffee. This, this is what rhetoric is, and you should be more alive to what it is and its power, which is a mixed thing. Um, good. That was, that was a very good question. I think we should give Professor Bartlett one last round of applause.
Thank you very much.